Good morning, Year Sixes. Welcome to Lesson 3 for English. This is the third time I've tried to record this video, so let's hope this one works well. Okay, you are going to need to open the lesson booklet, print it if you need to, otherwise get an English book ready to go so that we can answer the questions with haste. Um, this will probably be uploaded in two videos. Uh, because there's quite a bit of content to go through. All right, so let's just move on with it. We are going to be analysing the vocabulary of still image advertisements today. So I'm going to have a little bit more, hopefully, by the end of the lesson, you will understand and analyse the effects that vocabulary have in advertisements. All right, so let's get moving and have a look at the advertisement that we'll be looking at today. Come on, computer, let's go. All right, <clears throat> so we are going to have a look at this double dunk advertisement. Have a careful look through and I want you to consider the topic, the intended target audience, the choice of images, where are they placed, um, the layout of the text features on the page. Now what we're going to do is complete this table. Um, Please make sure that you are completing this as we go along. So you will be doing it with me or you'll be writing in your book. You'll be typing it directly into the PDF. So um, make sure that you're ready for that. If I move too quickly, feel free to pause the video and then commence when you are ready. Um, give yourself time to write things down. Make sure that you do because this will all be very, very beneficial for you later down the track. Okay, let's have a quick look at the topic. What product, service, brand or issue do you think the advertisement is about? Well, if you have a look at the advertisement, um, the advertisement is a product. So they're trying to advertise the double dunk basketball. Um, it's the product that's being held. It's also the product that is at the bottom of the advertisement. Um, audience, who do you think the target audience of this advertisement is and who would buy it? So remember in the previous lesson I talked about uh, target audience. So target audience isn't a particular age bracket of people. It is who do you feel it would appeal most to? Okay, who was it in line with? So being that this is a basketball, you're probably going to think somebody along the lines who is who does basketball, who participates in basketball, who um, has ambitions of um you know, losing words, <laughs> words are very difficult. Um, so somebody who is interested in playing basketball, who might be very athletic um, or who might follow basketball, they might want to have a basketball here that hopefully one day they'll get signed. Um, so people who are interested in basketball, long story short. Image, why do you think these images have been selected? Well, if you have a look at the image, um, You've got the product, so the product is being shown, um, and then you've got somebody who's using the product. That's why they've been selected. You've got a product there, and then you've got a celebrity or a superstar. I keep saying celebrity, and I apologise. Superstar. Sorry, professional basketball player who is using the product. Why do you think they, they've been selected? Well, because it's great to see their product being used. Um, and... I guess the idea is, is that if you use this basketball, you might achieve what Daryl Yell ha is achieving in this image. He's slam dunking. So perhaps um, the basketball might lead you to be successful. Having the basketball might lead you to be successful. Perhaps. Um, let's have a look at the layout. So images. Describe where the images are placed and why they've been put there. So if you're having a look at the image, you've got, at the very top of the advertisement, you've got Daryl Yell, who is using the product. He is slam dunking. The headline is placed in the middle of the advertisement. You've got the product at the bottom, and the black background ensures that there's, I guess, salience. So the important things are in the foreground. They are what your eyes go to straight away. The black also helps your eyes naturally move down the page. Um, so again, pause. If I am going very quickly, make sure you go back and write it. You can take this lesson at your own pace. As long as you do it and you listen, it's all good. All right, if we go down to headline, what is the headline and what does it tell us? The headline is 
I can be my best with double dunk basketballs. What does it tell you? Well, it tells you that um, the be my best is being emphasised. So because it's in cap locks, he's saying I can be my best with this product. It also includes his name. And having a superstar, professional, celebrity with their name <clears throat> and face on an advertisement, it's like an endorsement. So they're recommending the product. So I guess his name, his quotation being the headline, is kind of like an endorsement. Um, so he's saying to be the best, get the basketball. For him to be his best, get the basketball. Underneath this is be your best. So I think it's kind of suggesting to you this basketball is going to help you be the best that you can be at basketball. All right, copy text. Is there any copy text? Why or why not? There is no copy text in this advertisement. How do we know that? Well, nowhere on this advertisement does it give you more information. Does it need any more? Not really. So the creators of this advertisement have said, you know what, this headline, these images, they are as pers they are persuasive on their own. It is already quite an effective advertisement without um, busying it up with, with copy text. So it is persuasive with the features as it is. Um, so it doesn't, it's not needed, it's not necessary. Logo, describe the logo, what is their slogan, what does the slogan tell us? Um, okay, so the logo is down the very bottom. You can see the basketball has, it says double dunk, but on top of that is a silhouette of a basketball player who is also holding a basketball. And you can see that they've got that stance of a slam dunk as well. <coughs> it looks like um, the advertisement. So if you have a look at the position that Daryl Yell is in, he's, I mean, his hand, he's got a very similar pose. So it's like that they have, um, imitated their logo with the stance of Daryl Yell as well, which is pretty cool, I think. Um, what is their slogan? Double dunk. I think that's their slogan. Double dunk. Um, what does the slogan tell us? Mm, not sure really what it tells you, but there is a slogan and that's how you would describe it, I guess. All right, we are going to move on. Now, I at home cannot open video part one and video part two. So what I have done instead is the following few slides will be talking about vocab, language devices, language features, um, everything that video two does. Video one is essentially everything we've just talked about. It's kind of what are the text features of this advertisement and going through the questions we've already talked about. So you don't really need to watch part one if you would prefer to watch um, the double dunk advertisement part two, so number four, you can do that. Um, you'd have to go and click on it yourself in your PDF. It won't work for me at home, but it should work for you guys. So go and click that. Otherwise, just continue on with me because I'm going to do the same thing, except a little bit quicker and probably a little bit better. You decide. All right. Language devices. So language devices refer to features used by writers in their works to convey their message in a simpler manner to readers. Um, when used properly, the different literary devices help readers to appreciate, interpret, analyze advertisements. Um, language devices used in advertisements also make it interesting. It makes it fun. It makes it quirky. Um, they use a lot of play on words, you know, common idioms and metaphors, similes, personification, alliteration, and rhetorical questions. Rhetorical questions are used a lot in advertisements. So these are just fancy names for ways that we use language. Okay, so we use these language features all the time, every day, in everyday language. We use rhetorical questions all the time. Like mum might say, are you kidding me? Or you might say that to a friend or you've got to be joking. That's a rhetorical question. It doesn't, it doesn't need a response. So we use these things all the time. These are just the formal names for them. So let's break them down as quickly as we can for you to get an idea of how to tell the difference between these language features. Let's start with a metaphor. I'm sorry if the video cuts through the um, description at all, 
I'll have to work on that later. So a metaphor. What is a metaphor? A metaphor is a term or phrase that is used to make a comparison between two things that aren't alike um, but have something in common. So metaphors say something is something else. For example, the snow is a white blanket or the hospital was a refrigerator. Uh, she is my garden guardian angel. Her voice, her lovely voice was music to my ears. So a lot of these um, are not literal. They're figurative language. Figurative language means they're not actually happening so the snow is not an actual white blanket but it's a way of describing it very poetically um she is my guardian angel i could say that um my grandma is my guardian angel is she really no but it's a nice way of describing how i feel about her what her relationship is like okay so personification is a bit easier to understand personification is when you give human qualities or abilities to an object or an animal that doesn't usually have those characteristics. Um, it is a tool that really does add interest and fun um, and advertisements do use this quite a bit as well. So for example, the lightning danced across the sky. The whole idea, the way that you identify personification is can lightning dance in a way that we can dance? No, but it's a nice way of saying that lightning shot across the sky. You know, um, Rita heard the last piece of pie calling her name. Does a pie call out, hey, Rita, come and eat me? No, of course it doesn't. So you're giving something that's not living um, a human quality or characteristic or an ability. So the pie is not literally calling Rita's name, but Rita wants to eat that last piece of pie. So she's going to eat that last piece of pie. All right. So um, it's the same thing. One more example, just to make sure that you really understand it. Traffic slowed to a crawl. Do cars crawl? You know, like a baby would crawl or you would army crawl on the ground. No, but it is a it's a, it's a human quality or an ability that adds a bit of um, fun or interest to a description as opposed to the, the, the traffic was so slow I could heal my here my wheels turn on the bitumen yeah it's not as fun and interesting so personification is is giving something that doesn't usually have that characteristic that's human like a characteristic that's human like all right simile 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 now simile and metaphors can quite often be confused all right so we've already gone through um a metaphor let's talk about a simile a simile is a figure of speech that directly compares two different things. The, the simile is usually a phrase that begins with as or like. Okay, so the simile usually uses as or like when they're comparing. For example, um, he is as big as an elephant or um, she can swim like a fish. So you, a person and a fish, you are comparing the two by saying that they are similar using as or like um as boring as watching paint dry so you know that that's a simile because it's using the keyword as um she is as bright as a button all right um he is like they are like two peas in a pod so the keywords you want to look for are as and like those are very key indicators that it is a simile so you're comparing two things two different things they are like two peas in a pod. So um, my daughter and her best friend are like two peas in a pod. Okay, so two different things. You're saying that they're similar though because peas in a pod are very close in a pod. Two friends are very close in real life. Okay, moving on. Alliteration. Um, alliteration happens when the words that start with the same sound are used close together in a phrase or a sentence. So um so repeating the same letter or same sound so jolly like jolly jumping beans the j sound is being repeated um come and clean your closet there's the c sound repeated so alliteration is fairly easy to pick up on uh, okay moving on to rhetorical questions a rhetorical question is a question that you ask without expecting an answer we use these all the time um, half the time without even realizing because we don't go I'm about to ask a rhetorical question you usually just phrase the question and most people pick up on 
um, the intention of the question. Um, a question might be one that does not have an answer. It might be also one that has an obvious answer. Uh, but you've asked the question to make a point, to persuade, or for literary effects. So <clears throat> sometimes they are asked to, I guess, spark debate, to get you to, I guess, think about the topic or um, the product or the, the theme, um, and just to get people to think about it. So, like, if, for an example, um, the ones I have listed there are really silly ones. Um, you know, is, there's no point, is there? If somebody says that, it's kind of not asking for a response. It's kind of saying, I've given up, you know, read between the lines. You know, when people say, are you kidding me? You don't expect someone to say, yeah, I am. You, you're picking up on the, the vibe or the intention behind the question. Um, let's have a look at the two ad advertisements that I have here. Um, the Nike Air one is, so now what's your excuse? Now, the idea isn't for the target audience to then go, okay, one, two, three, here are my excuses. It's to say, you've got these shoes, you've got everything you possibly need, let's go. Like it's trying to prompt you to get going as opposed to respond to the question. Um, if you look at the one on the, on the left here, I think so, yeah. Uh, you wouldn't eat 22 packets of sugar. Why are you drinking them? Obviously, we don't need to know <clears throat> the can of, of the, the soft drink being used there, but we can probably pick up on that. So it's getting you to think. The whole idea of using the rhetorical questionnaire is to get you to consider what you're putting in your body. It's not going to, it's not asking you to respond to that. It's asking you to think about your choices. It's getting you to think about you know everything that you're digesting and if, if there's 22 packets of sugar and a glass of soft drink that you drink every day wow that's a lot you know reconsider what you're doing there okay that's a rhetorical question okay all right I'm gonna go back one um evaluative language now this one can be a bit hard to pick up on but let's just see how we go so evaluative language is positive or negative language that judges the worth of something um, it includes language that expresses feelings and opinions um, and to make judgments about aspects of people such as behavior or to assess quality of objects such as literary works so um, they are the best in the class the evaluative language there is best and you are I guess putting um, passing a, a judgment or an opinion upon something. If you are saying these four students are the best um, mathematicians in the class, you are passing um, a judgment. You're an expressing an opinion. Um, we should be grateful for what we have. You know, expressing that you should be grateful is, is expressing a feeling. Um, after the tornado, most of the houses remain largely untouched. That's expressing um, Assessing the quality of something. Okay, well, those houses are great. Those ones are not so much. Um, the film was terrible and the acting was atrocious. So the, you're passing a judgment upon a film or you're evaluating the worth and you are assessing, I guess, the acting skills of the actors within the film. So it's kind of any time you express a feeling or an opinion of something or passing a judgment. So it's not necessarily on people or um, it could be on objects, it could be on people, it could be on the state of something. So it's positive and neg negative language that judges the worth of something. He was the best player on the team. Well, they were fantastic. That's an opinion or a feeling. And it can be negative as well. They were horrendous. They, you know, this pattern is overbearing, overbearing, over the top. Um, their swimming was excellent. Okay, so positive and angle, negative language that passes judgment, worth, feeling, opinion. You'll pick up on that as we as we as we go on. Okay, let's get moving. So I want you to scroll on down. Um, so underneath question four, I think it's part of question four. So we've got questions A, B, and C. We're going to go through and answer these as best we can. Okay, so um, I think these are the right ones. Yeah, they are. 
So vocabulary, language devices and imagery. So imagery are those things like your metaphors, your similes, your um, personification, the things that aren't literal. They're figurative. You make it up. So if you say that the lightning danced across the sky, in your head you form an image. So that's kind of what it's provoking you to do there. Think, um, think in your head about it. She was a walking dictionary. So I'm not literally saying she was a dictionary with legs. You're saying that somebody is quite great at spelling. Okay, let's return. So these things can be used to make people feel or think a certain way about an advertisement. Some of the techniques are the ones that we've talked about. So evaluative language, you've got noun, noun groups, verb and verb groups, alliteration, simile, metaphor, personification, and rhetorical question. Let's have a look at the questions. The word best is used in the slogan in the headline. Explain what effect it would have if the author used to try your hardest. Um, I guess the main message is that if you buy the double dunk basketball, you will be the best you can be at playing basketball. And you might be as good as Daryl Yell, who was, I guess, the, the, the promoter, no, the endorser of the advertisement. Um, if you try, if you use the word hardest, um, it wouldn't make the same connection with the the sports the sports person, and I don't think it has the same um, degree of modality. It's not you know, try your hardest. It's a, it's not very good modal language. You try your best, be your best, do your best. It just has a more positive and it has a stronger um, connotation attached to it. So you write this whatever way you would like to write this. Um, as long as it's one or two sentences and give it a bit of an ex explain the effect that it has if you change the wording. All right, B, the relationship between being your best and using double dunk basketball is an example of which technique used in the box below. Um, is an example of evaluative language because it shows a positive judgment of a person who uses the double dunk basketball. So it's being your best and using the basketball. So remember, I even used an example of they are the best, doing your best, being the best. It's passing a positive um, a positive judgment of a person. You're going to do this. You are going to be the best. That's, that's positive language. C, give one example of alliteration used in the advertisement. Now, remember alliteration is when you're repeating the letter of the sound multiple times. Um, it could be twice, three, four times. And in this advertisement, have a think about it. When have they done that? It's the title, Double Dunk, Double Dunk. So that's when they've um, done that. So Double Dunk is a form of alliteration. Okay, what you're going to need to do now is have um, the advertisement number two, the NBT um, eco flag advertisement ready. Now we're going to use all of that stuff and we're going to bring all of that into this advertisement. Now we've used this advertisement a few times and hopefully that will make this process a bit easier. So what we're going to do is analyze the effect of language choices in this advertisement. So read through the advertisement below looking for each of the vocabulary techniques mentioned in the yellow box previously. All right, let's have a look at the first one. Why do you think the authors chose to use the word eco as in eco flag and what does it make the reader think? Well, what does it make you think when you read eco? Um, it makes the reader think that it's environmentally friendly. So the word eco is short for environment or environmental. Um, so I would say something along the lines of it makes the reader think it is an environmentally friendly product. You can say it differently if you'd like. Now, I do expect that you're doing this along with me, guys, all right? So this will be the last video, and I've got a lot to get through in a short time. So may, I'm going to be going quite quickly. Pause when you need to. Uh, let's go to the yellow box. Use the term friendly threads in an example. Uh, using the term Friendly threads is an example of which technique. So friendly threads. No threads think think your clothing. They're a bunch of threads all woven together. Can they be friendly? Is that a human characteristic or ability? 
should be saying yes. What is that an example of? It's an example of personification. So make sure you write personification down. What do the words silky look and feel tell the reader about? Um, they give us an impression of the type of product that is used um, and how it will feel and look when you wear it. Okay, so that's what silky look and feel tell the reader. It's like, oh, okay, it's going to feel comfortable. It's how it's going to look on me. It's how I'm going to feel while I'm wearing it. Down the bottom, list any words or statements that show the environmental topic of this advertisement. So you're looking for particular words that show um, that it's an environmental or eco um, topic or theme within it. So ones that I found were renewable resources. So that's an example that you can put down. Um, it doesn't hurt the environment. When they use that phrase, doesn't hurt the environment. Um, those were the ones that I found to be um, the best. All right, we're going to keep going. After reading this advertisement, what is your perception of this product? What do you think about it? And would you want to buy it? Why or why not? Um, so, again, you've got to think about the target audience here. It is technically asking for your opinion. So, um, you can write anything here that I guess answers the question um, and make sure you explain it if it's no explain why um, be sensible though I don't want I don't care about the environment type responses I want you to kind of be a bit more mature about it so let's see how you go here I would write something along the lines of um, I like the sound of the clothing because it doesn't harm the environment um, I probably would want to know more before I bought something um, because I'm not sure if it would be better than another fabric such as cotton. Because cotton is something that we know is good for our body. It's very breathable material. So for me, I like that it doesn't hurt the environment, but I'd also want to learn more about it. I want to know more about the product or what you can buy. So I'd want to do more research into it. So you might have something different. As promised, guys, this lesson is still continuing. <laughs> Um, quite happy for you to keep, continue going on your own and do question seven on your own. Um, please make sure that you do do it. Practice changing the vocab in the advertisement or do it along with me now and get it over and done with. All right, let's have a look at question seven. So we're going to go through and play with um, the words of advertisement number one in a previous lesson. So great for any gifts advertisement. Please make sure if you uh, need it to have the advertisement open. And ready to go. I'm just going to go through and see if I can answer them as best I can. Please make sure that you write it down, type it into the PDF, whichever. All right, so let's um, go through and answer the questions. So adapting. Change presents to gifts. So remember how Great Green Gifts has um, is within the advertisement. So what would happen if we looked at the word presents and changed them? Hmm. Give two different meanings for the word present. Well, present could be in the sense that you are physically giving a present or present as in living in present tense. Um, present could mean a gift, present could mean here and now. Um, B, the statement presence for the future could have two different meanings. And what are they? Again, you can write something completely different in year six. You don't need to write the same as me. Um, so what could be the two different meanings? I wrote it could mean giving a gift to the future rather than destroying it. And also the future still being around or existing or being present. Let's see how we did that. Okay, if we go to the next one. If you change the word presents to gifts, what would happen to the double meaning of the statement presents for the future? Well, it would remove the idea that we, that what we do now in the present will affect the future. So it kind of completely get, gets rid of that notion altogether. Um, so that play on words is essentially non-existent. Um, D. Which of the changes to vocab mentioned on the previous page does this show? Changes nouns to a change, 
changes to nouns and existing noun groups, changes to verbs, changes to evaluative language around feeling and opinion. It is the first one, changes to nouns and extended noun groups. Now we're going to go into that a bit better later down the track. I'm just going to keep going because this lesson is already going for way too long. Adaption 2, change harm to destroy. Look at the word harm. If you've replaced it with the word destroy, does that make it sound like you will do more or less damage to the environment? Um, it makes it sound like you will do more damage to the environment because destroy has a very strong and negative connotation as opposed to harm. So think like obliterate. It's got a completely different um, connotation or meaning. All right, if we go to F. Why do you think the author will have chosen the word harm instead of destroy? Um, I think because it has two meanings. Um, you won't harm the environment and you won't harm your pocket. So meaning you won't spend too much money buying these gifts. So destroying your pocket makes the reader makes the reader think of not spending money. So um, you won't harm the environment and you won't harm your pocket. Whereas if you changed it with destroy, it's not going to have the same meaning at all. Um, and those changes, if I'm going to go to G, I'm going to just kind of fly through them. G would be the last two. Changes to verbs, changes to evaluative language, feeling and opinion, around feeling and opinion. <clears throat> H, look at the word save. Read the entire sentence it is in. If you replaced the second save with protect, how would the sentence change? So again, have the advertisement open and have a read of it. Um, okay, so even though replacing the word save with protect um, could convey the same meaning, even probably a bit more clearly, um, the repetitive use of the word save actually creates a greater impact in the case, uh, in this case, and makes the audience think that they will both save money and the planet if they buy these gifts. So um, while protect might be more clear, um, using the word save repetitively gives a greater impact, okay? So you may or may not have the same thing. It's okay if you don't. Um, which of the changes to vocab mentioned the previous one? Or what do they show? Uh, I'm going to skip past I and go to number eight. All right, so you really have to think very clearly about the vocab you use. Okay, if you're going to be repetitive with your language, make sure that there's a purpose. Using present instead of gift, there's a purpose to using the word present. The double meaning is there. And while it might not seem apparent up front, if you think a bit clearly about why or what double meanings the words have, it's quite clever, the vocab that they used within that advertisement. And changing it can have very different effects upon the advertisement's purpose and the, I guess, persuasive nature of the advertisement. So um, you've got to think very, very carefully about that. So number eight is asking you to consider the adaptations or the vocab changes um, and rewrite the heading and the copy text of the advertisement. Um, write two to three sentences to explain how your design has affected the advertisement. I'm going to get you to go ahead and do that on your own, get you to do it in your English book or on a notepad, and see if you can change the language, but still let it be as um, purposeful and persuasive as the original was. Okay, guys, that officially wraps up the lesson for today. Apologies for the length, but we know that English usually takes us an hour, so... Sometimes the lessons are going to be quite long. If you are still hanging in there and you committed to the end, I am very proud of you. All right, until tomorrow, guys, have a great day. See you later.